Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, this afternoon, this horrible day. Um, raining outside. I said to Tony over lunch that he must have brought the weather with him from London. Um, so, but anyway, it's lovely to have you here. Um, Tony Phillips is a radio and podcasting creator, and his career has taken him from producing, reporting, and commissioning, and being the commissioning editor at the BBC World Service and BBC Radio 4. Um, to being vice president at WNYC Studios in New York and to Broccoli Content, Sony Music in the UK. At WNYC, he created and developed a piece of work with Abby Jacobson, made in partnership with MoMA, was the executive producer on Freakonomics Radio with the Stephen Dubner and managed editorial partnerships also. Most recently, he has written and reported on, uh, uh, on Archive on 4 for BBC Radio 4 and on the tragic life of da David Oluwale, a Nigerian migrant to Britain in the 1960s. Tony is executive producer with independent TV company Northern Town Productions and part of the award-winning team who produced the Liverpool-based Statues Redress documentary film for Sky Arts, questioning the presence, place and power of public statues. In 2022, Tony completed his PhD. It's a kind of new, a newer form of PhD, which I think is just fascinating, called the PhD by publication. Um, just a great idea at the University of East Anglia, writing about audio storytelling and the African diaspora. Tony's work really situates him at the center of many contemporary, important contemporary debates on questions of decolonizing sound and decolonizing the archive and the thus the curriculum, on new and old technologies and their figurations of race, of monuments and what should be done with statues of owners of enslaved people or colonizers, police, police brutality, um, and many other kinds of, kinds of issues that I think are really animating um, uh, many conversations today. His work came to my attention because of the four radio programs made with John Hope Franklin uh, for the BBC over 10 years. But also striking is the agenda he created for himself to change the voices heard, produced and archived at the BBC and beyond the BBC. And some of the extraordinary figures he has met over the years and worked with, including Rosa Parks, Daniel Barenboim, Skip Gates, and many others. And he has amazing stories about all of them, actually. Um, uh, he has just completed a, a podcast around uh, questions of race and opera as well. So moving into the question of sound and voice in a different kind of direction as well now. I'm really delighted to have him with us today. Welcome, Tony, and I will pass the podium to you. Thank you very much. Um, it's a daunting task to even start to contemplate what I'm about to try and do, um, at least in my mind. Uh, it, it's a bit like standing on the edge of a vast forest with thousands of trees representing the longevity and the achievements of John Hope Franklin. And my job this afternoon is to try and navigate myself and you through this massively dense and rich terrain in about 40 minutes or so. So here's how I'm going to try and do it. So between 1995 and 2005, I was a radio producer at the BBC in London. And across that span of time, I developed and produced, as Ranji said, four programmes either about John and his work and his life, or with John as a special contributor. That's about two and a half hours of actual airtime. Um, and for me, in total, that means from the raw tape, that means about 30 hours uh, of material, which is close to 2,000 minutes of material. And so... Today, with you, from those 2,000 minutes, representing my own 
little forest of voices and thoughts and sound, I'm going to share with you about eight minutes of sound, of tape. So you can see how daunting that is. Um, so these eight minutes will be made up of four extracts, one from each of the programs I made with John. So what we're talking about here are just four little trees in a forest of a lifetime. And with each project, John revealed a little more each time of who he is and of the journey he's been on and the lessons he'd learned. And I hope to share with you today some of those lessons that I think I learned. So first of all, thank you, Ranji, uh, for extending this invitation to me and to Michael and Eric and Pamela and Renee for making it possible for me to join you all here today. It's a huge privilege. So when I got to the BBC as a trainee producer, I spent a lot of my time in the BBC archives. And what I was doing in there was looking for what was there, but actually I was more interested in what wasn't there. Um, I was looking for voices and stories that are underrepresented. And that's a position that has framed much of my work in radio and in podcasting, seeking out the voices that are not represented. And that was the reason why I ended up studying American history at the University of East Anglia in the 1980s. Um, I was close to deciding which university to go to when I kind of had a moment of clarity in a bookshop. And when I looked across the books, there was one title that jumped out, and it was a book called To Be a Slave by Julius Lester. And this book was aimed at children, and the introduction explains that the content of the book was taken from those 2,000 or so interviews that were carried out as part of the Federal Writers Project in the 1930s. And the book essentially is culled from those interviews, and it gives a blow-by-blow -blow account of what it was to be an enslaved person in America um, over, over centuries. Um, Stories about food, about life on the plantation, about work, about celebrations. Uh, but there was a, a quote in the preface that really stuck out for me. And it was a quote from an ex-slave from Tennessee. It's a very powerful and moving quote. And it also has helped to guide my career. The quote says, to know Negro history, you have to talk to the person who wore the shoe. Now, these words were powerful on two levels at least. First, there was no name attached to this ex-slave, just ex-slave. Secondly, the voices of those closest to history, the f those first-person accounts really mattered. They, they really mattered. And it's profoundly important to try and capture those voices. Now, that was an idea and a principle that I developed and greenlit working with my brother, Kaz, as the host of a series where we wanted to capture some of those experiences uh, about American history. And um, we set about inviting guests to speak about key moments in American history, if not from personal experience, but then from the perspective of knowledge and experience and insight. And we wanted to cover a large span of time from slavery to freedom. We called the series Spirit of America, and we booked the following guests, working backwards in time, Johnny Cochran on the LA riots and Rodney King, Rosa Parks on the Montgomery bus boycott, Paul Robeson Jr. on McCarthyism, uh, the late Ron Brown, Commerce Secretary on the Wall Street crash and the Depression era, and David Levering Lewis on the Harlem Renaissance. And for the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863, of course, John Hope Franklin. Uh, and this was my first meeting with John. So what I want to do is to introduce to you the first of my John Hope Franklins. And um, this is John Hope Franklin, the time traveler. And in this extract, you'll hear John 
reflect on this historic day, January the 1st, 1863, and if you'll agree with me, uh, he speaks as if he was there. And that was a very interesting day itself. The 1st of January, 1863, the president, as on every New Year's Day, held a great public reception. People just came to the White House if they wanted to shake hands with the president and greet him and enjoy uh, the hospitality of the White House. And so from about noon that day, for several hours, the president received visitors, shook their hands, and uh, wished them a Happy New Year, and they wished him the same. Then later on, when the Secretary of State uh, and his assistant, his son, uh, brought the proclamation over, it had been seized, it had been written and sealed, the seal had been given by the Secretary of State, as all executive documents were. Uh, then the president uh, went upstairs to sign it. And he said on that occasion, as he began to sign it, his hand began to shake. Uh, and for the moment, he forgot that that was probably because he had, he had been shaking hands for several hours. Uh, but he, as he held his hand and tried to steady it, uh, he took notice of this and then said that if I've ever been certain about what I'm doing, uh, if I'm doing the right thing, uh, I know that I'm doing the right thing and signing this document. And he signed it. And then it was proclaimed. Uh, people in various parts of the North were waiting to get the word. They had a symbol in places like Tremont, Temple, and Boston, and various auditoriums in New York and other places to get the word. And finally, the word came through. As the formerly enslaved man from Tennessee might have said, John Hope spoke as if he wore the shoes, as if he was there in the room. And that's the depth of his research enabling him to time travel and almost shape shift into becoming a guest in the White House that morning, witnessing history unfold. Every now and then, I used to receive an envelope from my brother containing an interesting article from a magazine. In April 1996, one of those came through with a copy of a New Yorker article by a writer called Scott Malcolmson. It was all about a town called Bowley, Oklahoma. And Bowley was one of the collections of all black towns set up in the late 19th century and early, early years of the 20th century. Approximately 50 of these towns sprung up in Oklahoma. And there were others elsewhere. Eatonville in Florida was where Zora Neale Hurston lived. But John Hope was born in 1915 in one of these towns, Rentisville, named after the landlord, William Renty. And sometimes stories arrive almost fully formed. I pitched the idea to the BBC of taking John Hope back to Rentisville for him to take me and the audience on a trip back to his childhood, to his parents, to where he grew up, to tell me and the audience, his memories and experiences of growing up in this all black town. So I pitched a 30 minute documentary called Hope in Oklahoma and began work on it in 1998. Just so you know, the way it worked is that I'd be given a budget, a modest budget, maybe 6,000, 7,000 pounds, about $9,000. And I'd have to travel, record, research, book hotels, interviews, sort out the meals and the transportation and the editing. And all of this would be done in about three or four weeks from start to finish uh, to deliver the final product. So many of us who were fortunate enough to have met John, um, my guess is most of us, if not all, would at some point say just how calm he was just how controlled he was with his emotions and how measured he was. Well, for me, I think in this clip, which I accidentally just started, um, I think this is perhaps where he got his first most important lesson in this. And so this is the second John Hope 
Um, I call it John Hope, the minister, the master of control. This is the Cady Railroad, uh, which runs from, I suppose, all the way from Kansas City to down into Texas. This was our main connection with the outside world, the Cady Railroad. And we would uh, travel north to Muskogee on it, or south to Dakota on it. My mother and my sister and I uh, would uh, travel from uh, Reddittsville to Dakota to get our supplies. On one occasion, we always had to flag the, 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 uh, the train, by the way. There was no reason for it to stop here. There's no station. I don't sell any tickets or anything. But when the train stopped on this particular day, my mother and my sister and I got on. It turned out that we, they had stopped the train here at the crossing where the white coach was located. And so when we sat down, by this time the train is moving, you know, it's almost, it barely stops. The conductor came by and he said, you're in the wrong place. You should be in the Negro coach. And my mother said, well, uh, the train is moving now and I can't go from one coach to another with my children. Uh, it's too, the risk of, day of injury is too high. He said, well, I'll stop the train. He stopped the train, and he put us off a couple of miles down the road. We all thought that he was going to move us to the so-called Negro coach, but he didn't. And he put us off to our great chagrin, and so we had to trudge our way back to Rentersville. We, As we walked along the railroad track, I began to cry, and I told my mother and so on, you know, so many words that I, I thought it was terrible. A mean man. And she said to me very calmly, she said, Oh, you mustn't be disturbed. You know, they think they're better than you, but they aren't any better than you. They just have what they call the law on their side. But you must always remember, you must always remember that you are as good as anybody. And that regardless of where they make you sit or stand or anything else, that doesn't take anything away from you. It merely takes away from them. I'm sure you remember that. And I said, that's the last time I cried about something like that. That's the last time I felt bitter about something like that. And so that was my road from hate. <laughs> Those sounds, by the way, I couldn't control. That's that's us on the railroad with those cicadas and stuff. And um, it was hot. Um, but you get to know a person, any person. You get to know a person when you travel with them, I think. And John exercised great constraint and self-control as I drove him in the rented car from our hotel in Tulsa down to Rentisville and back. Now, I didn't tell him that it was the first time that I'd driven in the United States. And I also didn't tell him it's the first time I'd driven an automatic car. I was used to that. And I think he knew, but, it, but he didn't say a word about my, uh, shall we say, rudimentary driving skills. Anyway, Rentisville was not, in the end, uh, the haven that his father, in particular, had expected. He was disappointed, bitterly disappointed by the lack of opportunities uh, that many families received to really make a go of it, to really make a success of life in this small town. And he was determined to withdraw, take his family to Tulsa, which in the end he did. So we're now halfway through the forest, okay? And we're about to encounter the third John Hope Franklin. I knew that broadcasters like the BBC, NPR, NBC, whatever, they're all keen on anniversaries. And I knew a big anniversary was coming up. This must have been around 2002, 2003. I knew that 2004, of course, was the 50th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education. And so my pitch was simple and straightforward. 
it would take me to Topeka, Kansas to meet and interview Linda Brown and all those involved. And then when I started to research further, I stumbled across details I didn't really know about. I didn't know that there were five cases bundled together to become known as Brown. And that the great young attorney and NAACP legal defense lead, Thurgood Marshall, was looking for test cases to bring to the Supreme Court to prove that separate education along racial lines was unequal and unconstitutional. And I didn't know that the first of these cases was Briggs versus Elliott in Somerton, South Carolina. So in the 1940s, one of the issues there for the Board of Education, uh, run by a man called Joe Elliott, was about him refusing to provide school buses for black children. One of the other factors I read about was that John Hope was deeply involved and critical to the work that Marshall was leading on as a legal historian. So I went back to my bosses at the BBC and I told them that I'd like to switch the focus away from Kansas and towards South Carolina and tell the story that way. So in asking John Hope to talk about his role, he chooses, as you're, as you're about to hear, he chooses to deflect and to concentrate on others, notably Marshall and his work ethic. He wanted me and the audience to know how this landmark ruling was achieved. We know the outcome. But here, here's John offering a little glimpse of what was under the hood of what it took to get there. This is the third John Hope, the proud foot soldier. I was teaching at Cornell University and Marshall called me and he said, what are you doing in the fall? I said, in the autumn, I will return to my job at Howard University. In Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C. And so he said, you know what else you will be doing? I said, no. He said, you'll be working for me. And if you don't work for me this fall, and then he gave me some threats of what he would do in a jocular way. And so I agreed to work for him in the fall of 1953. I went to New York City from Washington, D.C. every week, absolutely every week. I would leave on a Wednesday afternoon and go to New York and after having checked in at the hotel and so forth, I had dinner on the train. I went around the corner to the, the offices where Thurgood Marshall would be. He was there every day that I went, working diligently on the case. I never saw an individual work as hard as Thurgood Marshall worked on this case, not ever anywhere. It was, it was amazing. I remember so well that some nights he would say at midnight, at midnight, he would say, Oh, we'll take a 15-minute break, <clears throat> at which time I took a break. And I broke out of there and went to my hotel and went to bed because I can't work day and night. But he did, as though he were driven by some force. And this, this was the thing that inspired us to work hard because we wanted to help him in every way possible prove his argument that separate was inherently unequal. So uh, the edge of the forest is now in sight. I remember John Hope explaining why he left Chicago when he, where he ran the history department at the University of Chicago. He said something like, at my age, almost 70, it was just too cold. So he went on to talk about his excitement of coming south and Duke had made him a wonderful offer, the James B. Duke Professorship of History. Uh, perhaps more than anything else, it was warm. I remember him saying he's done his time with that sort of weather. I also recall that at the time, there were articles and papers being written and discussed about a so-called reverse migration of black Americans choosing to leave the Northern cities to return to live in the South. So in 2004, I wanted to explain the South for the BBC in a documentary I call Southern Road. I wanted to do a road trip 
Now, I'd spoken to John about whether he wanted to drive for a week or so with me. Ill health was his reason, but I have a feeling he remembers my driving. I did what I would normally do in these situations. I did my own reading and thinking, of course, but I spoke to my brother. He'd recently come across a book called Mississippi, An American Journey, written by a poet called Anthony Walton. And I was in Chicago at a time when Anthony was visiting his family. We met, we discussed the project and a route, and some weeks later, we set off, meeting up in Birmingham, Alabama, and driving to Montgomery, Tuskegee, Atlanta, Charleston, and Richmond, Virginia. Our penultimate stop was Durham, North Carolina, to meet up with John Hope Franklin at his home. We'd met with Anthony's cousins and aunts and uncles in a spectacular suburb of Atlanta, and he wanted to talk to John Hope about progress. So this is John Hope, committed civil rights activist. In Atlanta, with family members of mine in the southern part of Fulton County, in a very grand black subdivision, McMansions, perfect lawns. So I'm wondering, Dr. Franklin, if you would consider that as progress. If you mean by progress, economic improvement, yes. Yes. If you mean by it, a, a progression toward a state of society in which people have an inter interconnection, interrelationship, regardless of race, I would say no. I don't regard it further. I regard this as increased and glorified and for some people commendable segregation. As long as they have their own manicured lawns and their mansions and their own country clubs and so forth, I want to be certain that you understand it. that means you have full meal and that you you're not hungry, and that you can enjoy yourself in a limited fashion. But it does not mean, it does not represent to me the movement toward an ideal social situation. By social, I mean in the broad sense of, of, of people, people to people situation. It does not mean you've made much progress. It means that you have lifted yourself out of the ghetto where you were with nothing into a ghetto where you are with almost everything you want, a need. That is not all that different from the experience you would have 150 years ago. I want more than that. I want to be able to live in a society where I can learn from whoever is my next door neighbor. He doesn't have to be black or brown or yellow or white. He has to be a human being. And that's all I require. What I want to do in my society, in my life, is to de-emphasize the differences and create a society in which we just have everything in common. And I believe that's the only way in which we can really have equality. We have all these meetings and journeys and meals and phone calls and meetings in his club in Manhattan. These were gifts for me. And um, I think it helped me become a better program maker and, and probably a better person. They've certainly made the BBC archives immeasurably richer. But being guided by the voice and the experience of John Hope Franklin, it's not a bad route to take through life, academic or otherwise. And a building and an institution bearing his name is a fantastic oasis for any traveler. Moreover, <clears throat> 
Some of you will know that John was perhaps most at peace in his greenhouse with his beloved orchids. He always walked me through his greenhouse to show me what's coming up, what's new, what's thriving. And always his pride and joy was Aurelia, named after his wife who died in 1999, a decade before him. So to see him delicately coaxing little orchids to grow, to blossom, is really how I remember him tenderly encouraging others to grow and develop and bloom, whether as historians, musicians, artists, politicians, radio makers. But the encouragement was always to follow a path of humanity and kindness. So thank you, John. Thank you. Of course. <laughs> However, we want to do it. We have a microphone for recording purposes. I did want to say I did I didn't put this in, uh, but John runs the. Um, audio part of the Center for Documentary Studies. Is that correct? And John invited me to a, a conference in a, around 2010. I was then a, a commissioning editor at the World Service. And he'd invited some of the delegates to play a piece. So knowing that I was coming to Durham, I immediately thought of John. And so I played um, Separate But Equal about Brown versus Board. I remember when John introduced me, there was a kind of, nobody really knew that I was connected to this documentary, but I could hear just around me, some of the other delegates went, oh God, no, not this. Like they knew that what this story was because everybody knows about Linda Brown. And I, I just sat there quietly listening with, with, with others. And then luckily one or two people did come up to me and say, we didn't know this. We had no idea about this. Um, and I guess that's that's kind of what I was getting at with, with what John can do and what John did for me, which is encourage you to go the extra mile to, to get to the heart of the story as, as truthfully as you can. So thank you for inviting me. I I'll, I'll I have yes. a question and then I'll pass it to the people in front. So first of all, thank you very much. That was amazing. And um, the thing that really shines through in your storytelling is the sound of being in a place with the great John Hope Franklin, so that he's not just the great John Hope Franklin up on a pedestal, but he's someone walking along beside you. And so. Um, I just want to say how much I appreciate that grounded friendship, hearing the cicadas, hearing the train, hearing the birds is just is, is part of the gift of hearing this, this archive. And so with all of that, first want to ask a question about how in the world did you get, you know, the funding at that time to uh, do that kind of storytelling and what kind of outlets are available today? I know this is not about Dr. Franklin, but for that kind of rich storytelling that that allows us to hear a person in their place and allows you to get to know them so that you know the orchids and, and you can tell a story about them as a whole person. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, as for the funding, it's not much money. Okay, it's CBC. You can pay uh, anyone for that. Uh, you don't join the BBC to get rich. <laughs> So the, the, the budgets were really quite modest. I said it's about eight or nine thousand um, dollars. But it's enough. You know, many people calculate flight, hotel, food. There's not much left at the end, but you spend it. Um, 
Now, as for the sound, um, I think every radio maker has a choice. You can, you can just get him on a line, tell him to go into a local radio studio, and you can do it that way. That's one way of telling a story, but that's never been, frankly, it's never really been of interest to me. Um, because I think if you take somebody to the place, you are going to get more than just, you know, some opinion. Um, and John understood that. I didn't have any um, challenge from him to let's let's sit in the garden where it's a bit noisy, or let's walk down this road, let's walk around Renton. He was very old uh, when we went to Renton. He must have been in his quite easily probably in his early to mid eighties, and it was really hot. But he wanted to do it because he knew the value of being there. He knew that there was there were going to be encounters that you won't get in the sort of studio. So uh, I appreciate, I really appreciate that he liked those sounds and the train did go by just at that moment. Uh, I didn't plant it in there after him, um, which I could have done after him. Um, but it was, you know, I think if you take somebody there, it's just part of what you want to reflect on tape is is the whole experience as much as you can. Um, I just think you get a better story. But it is a choice that most producers have. They can do it if they want. And I always want it. Oh. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. That was that was wonderful. Um, the the question that I have is for us in America, everything that you did felt urgent. Right, like all three of those um, stories that you um, excerpted from felt very urgent. How do you have a sense as to how those stories are received in England or abroad? And do you have a sense as to how, in some ways, what you're doing is uh, a form of history, creating writing history? How does it flow out to out of America and then flow back in? Right. How does it flow? You know, like a, it's a historian in England writing about America. Yeah. Um, how does that, how do the, so there's information, there's a story going out to England, yes. but then it must, of course, bounce back to the US, right? Do you have a sense as to how that operates? Like, um, what was the response uh, within the UK? And then, that story must have flown, come back into the U.S., right? There must have been a U.S. audience as well. And what was the response to the U.S. audience of a U.K. producer collecting the story? This is a really good question. Um, I think when I was making these, these were all in the 90s, uh, in the 90s and then in the early part of 2000. Um, there was no social media to speak of. Um, we didn't really get a response. We didn't really know who was listening uh, at all. Um, so without making this sound like I was just deeply self-interested, I, I knew all the way back. It must have been day two at the BBC when I went down to the archive. I needed to ask somebody where it was. And it's this vast, hidden, dusty part of the BBC. But I knew that the stuff that was in here mattered. And I knew that I wanted to leave some things in there. Um, it's not as simple as that because with digitization, that's, that's really the way to leave things. Some of the things that I've made in the past, one or two of them, have just disappeared. They haven't been after. So the urgency for me you're right, there was an urgency to get some voices and some stories captured, made, crafted in a way that I hope that people would find engaging. So even back then, I knew the value of actually doing this work. It may not be for an audience that I can see, 
it, I may not receive any letters or faxes from anybody, but I had a strong sense that in time, maybe my children uh, would pick up, would be able to tap into these stories and listen to them and get some value from it. Um, and future generations can hopefully get something from them. So I wasn't thinking immediately about how will this be received in Britain? My job was to make a good story, was to tell a good story. And I think a good story should be universal. It doesn't, matter, it doesn't really matter what it's about. I'm making something, as Randy said at the moment, about classical music, opera, and black representation. I know very little about music. But I'm, I'm very interested in the stories behind it. So the stories seem important stories to tell. I couldn't really, I can't really read music. I can't tell you anything about opera, really. But there are stories that need to be told and need to be preserved. So my, my aim really was um, to trust my instincts as a storyteller, uh, tell the story that I think is worth telling in the best way possible, and hope that others will listen, whether the next week or the next decade or in the next, you know, millennium. I have a question. Sure. If I can ask. You, have the, um, you know, walking with Dr. Franklin, you are, you know, having these conversations, but you as a documentarian, how do you contort yourself to allow for his eminence, his personality to kind of shine, you know, as a documentarian, like how do you, how do you um, find that you adjust yourself with the interview subjects that you're with to allow them to be their full self, that you capture that mm. on audio? I, um, I'm probably not the first documentary maker who said that you have to learn the art of invisibility. But that's what I always try and do. So when you get out of a car with John Hope Franklin, as we did in Rentisville, and on the poster, by the way, it says, you know, there's a, there's a big sign saying Rentisville, home of Honey Springs, the Battle of Honey Springs. Underneath that, it says population 78. But that's what it was, 78. There were more than 78 people who turned up to meet him. Um, in simple terms, they haven't come to see me. They're not interested in the producer, the man holding the microphone. They're interested in him. So I'm, I'm very used to, um, yeah, getting out of the way and making sure that actually... You know, he's, they've come to see him. They're not, I'm not that sort of producer who will say, well, what about me? My job is to make sure that they know why they're here. That I know why they're here. And I, I, I've always known that nobody is interested in talking to a producer, really. Nobody. Thank you. Um. And yet, um, uh, one of the things I think that this is something that Lou was was suggesting too is that one of, one of the things that's very striking is is a sense of ease in John Hope Franklin's tone um, that makes it feel as if he's in conversation. Right? I mean, and you know, so so there's there's that sense of the conversational, even though. You have absented yourself from yes. from from that, um, and you know that's it's something quite. Um, I, I I don't know. I mean, I think that when when you're um, when you have something visual to rely on, mm -hmm. right? It's a there, there's something different that happens. Um, but I'm just curious about that kind of absence that 
that you know maybe maybe everyone knows about the art of invisibility in 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 radio um, or in oral history. I don't quite I don't quite know how how to how you craft that um, uh, so well, right? I mean, I think that there's a way in which that the implied presence of your absent voice um, is quite striking in that ease that suggested. Mm. Yeah. Um, there was a, uh, yeah, there was a, there was a documentary I made, which might answer this. There's a documentary I made about Malcolm X and it was actually about Malcolm X's archive, his personal effects going missing. One of the daughters, one of his six daughters, had all this stuff, his personal effects, his diaries, uh, his shoes, his suits, his letters, lots and lots of letters. She had all these in her house in New York. And then she, um, she moved to Florida. And um, she put it all in a storage company. And then she defaulted on the payment of the storage company. So the storage company took ownership of this stuff. Now, I knew, I, I got to know this because I was sitting in the Schomburg one day in New York and somebody walked by one of those porter guys with a big, it was not trolley, but a big packing case, big wooden packing case, about six foot tall, with Malcolm X written on the side. And I stopped the guy and I said, Malcolm X. And he said, yes. And I said, he's not in there, is he? And he said, no. Oh. So the friend that I was going to meet worked at the Schomburg as a, in the communications department, publicity, a writer, journalist called Joan Harris. So I was meeting Joan anyway. And I said, Joan, what's the story? So she told me what happened with one of the daughters. And so when it was sold in Florida, somewhere outside Fort Lauderdale, some market stall holder guy, flea market, he bought the stuff and then he, and he owned it legally. It's his. So he started to sell bits of Malcolm X stuff. And some some guy came along and he, he bought a couple of these letters. He said, have you got any more of these? He says, yeah. He said, oh, well, I'll buy whatever you've got. So the market stall holder said, oh, maybe I'm onto something here. So he stopped selling them there and he put them all to sale on an early version of eBay. And it was a, an auction. An auction was announced that in three weeks' time, I'm going to be selling all this stuff to the highest bidder. Word got back to New York that um, this was going to happen. So the city stepped in, public library stepped in, they bought the stuff for an undisclosed sum of money and it was retrieved and brought back to New York and a fellow was walking through the Schomburg one day, brought the stuff back and that was the stuff that walked past me. Now, I took one of the daughters, Ilyasa, back to the Schomburg as part of, as part of my documentary telling this story. And I, you know, we'd been running around New York for a couple of days, doing interviews here and there, going to see Uncle Ozzy. So I'd go and she took me to see Ozzy Davis and Ozzy Davis read the eulogy for me. It was great. And then uh, this was the most important part for me to hear something from the family. And when we got locked in this little room, she just went silent. She just started to stroke the stuff. And I thought I'd, she, I, there was nothing coming. She just looked at me and she said, um, do you expect me to say something? And she looked at me like, I'm not your friend anymore. That's what I was thinking. But I was thinking, well, we have been friends. We've had coffees. We've been running around. So I thought, well, what do I do as a producer now? Do I, what do I do? So I just stayed still. And for about 10 minutes, we looked at each other like that. And I was reading the letter upside down that was placed in front of her. 
and I was willing her to read this. So I just decided, right, well, I'm just going to stay here in as friendly a way as possible and just wait. Um, and I tried to, I imagined myself just disappearing. But at the same time, inside my head, I was saying, please pick it up, read it, talk to me. And eventually she did. It was about 10 minutes of silence. And I'm recording silence. No trains, cicadas, just silence and air conditioning. And when she did eventually read it, there was a look before she spoke at me, which is like, hmm. Okay. And then she said, all right, well, okay, so this is just some letter from, you know. Then she read it. She read it aloud. And she said, well, actually, it's not a simple letter. And the letter was from Mecca, 1964, from Malcolm to Betty. At one point, he said something like, I've ordered a new car. It's a Buick. It's blue. It's just like brother three X's. I've ordered the, the car to be delivered on such and such a date, but I may not be there. But I've also told them not to let you drive it because you'll only crash it. In brackets, smile. Close brackets. And so, so now Ilyasa was laughing. She was roaring with laughter. And she was saying things like, this is just beautiful. This is lovely. This is amazing. And by the end of it, she was just like, she put the letter down and said, you would just fall in love with this man. That's amazing. Now, I think all of that happened partly because I didn't push her. I didn't ask any questions at all. Um, and I think for the moment of my invisibility, I think she was able to calculate, is this guy worth talking to? Do I give him this stuff? And then when she did, she realized actually she was... This was stuff that she didn't know. So I, 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 I think invisibility works. And I think if I've got any skill as a radio producer, it's that. That I try and get out of the way because it, I know it's not about me. Um, does that answer your question? Then? Okay. Can I... Can I ask one more? And yeah. I'm I'm curious to know what happens, what where the other uh what twenty seven and a half hours of material <laughs> is. Um and you know, when when something's archived, yeah. um, like these pro what happens to all that stuff? Yeah. Um some of it is in a box. Some of this stuff is in a box in my loft. Some of it was reused uh you know yeah you kind of have to even back then you kind of had to reuse tape sometimes not always but a lot of it isn't kept which is really you know i always try and tell people now when they're starting out to just keep everything if you can but of course space is is expensive and if you're going to keep stuff in some kind of you know, digital space, that costs a lot of money. Um, so some of it is in a box, various shoe boxes, and some of it has just gone, I'm afraid. But, you know, those programs, they exist, and they are in the archive, and they are not easily accessible. But And, and are those... Um... So I know, well, presumably the copyright for the programs is held by the BBC. Mm -hmm. But what about the up, the other material? All of it is, is owned, owned by, by the, the BBC. BBC. Yeah. The stuff that isn't used also. Yeah. Interesting. Even your ideas at the BBC mm -hmm. are owned by the BBC. <laughs> yeah. All right, Tony, I'm going to ask a ridiculously unfair question oh. just to see. But I think you'd uh, just be curious what you'd do with this. Okay. Um, 
John Hope Franklin died. I had I had, had to be reminded. I quickly looked up. Passed away in two thousand nine, right? So shortly yeah. after Barack Obama's been elected. Yeah. And and this came out of uh, the last piece of tape you played, where he was talking about the question of kind of a progress of what what do we consider progress and not and so yeah. on and. Um, do you have any sense of what he would say <laughs> about what has happened since he left this earth in the U.S. in particular on matters of, uh, of race in particular, just based on if I were to ask you to try to channel him based on your relationship and, and having heard him talk for hours and hours? Well, uh, I don't really know what he would say. However, in 2008, was the last time, one of the last times we spoke. And it was in the middle of 2008. And I rang as I, as I did every few months. I knew his health was failing. And he'd, he'd said from pretty much the first time I met him, he said, I really want to come back to London. I love London. And he loves Cambridge in England. He, he spent a year at university there. And he wanted to come back, but he, he never, he knew it wasn't going to happen. But when we spoke in 2008, he said, um, he apologized and he said, I'm really sorry, but I don't think I'm going to be able to make it. And I'd almost forgotten, make what? And then he, he spoke about London and Cambridge again. And then he said, I'm, I, I'm always resisting doing impersonations, so I'm going to try and resist now. But he said, uh, guess what happened to me the other week? I think it might have been about a week earlier. I said, what? He said, this bus arrived outside my house. What was his, the name of his street? It was something like Pansy Road or Daisy Road or something? Anyway. Somewhere in Durham, where outside his house, this coach, this bus arrived. And he said, guess who got off the bus? I said, I did it then, see? Get off, get off. And I said, who? He said, Senator Obama. I said, well, why? He said, it was the campaign bus. And they were on their way to Winston-Salem. And I said, that's fantastic. He said, guess who sat at the front? I said, it was you, wasn't it? He said, yep. And he says, right next to the senator. And they went all the way to Winston-Salem. He said, we talked all the way. He did his thing, and then we talked all the way back. Dropped me back at my door. And I said, so what was it like? He said, amazing. He said he was intelligent. He said he was smart. He asked a lot of questions. Didn't get, give any more detail apart from that. Um, and it made him happy, really, really happy that actually he was a thinker. That's how I left the conversation. Um, I think he'd be disappointed. I think nothing disappoints him, disappoints him more about America or anywhere, but let's say America, than a lack of understanding of history. That's the thing that kind of, there is another clip which I, I kept as a, as a little treat, if, if you can call it a treat, but um, it was at the end of the conversation that he did with my brother. Shall I just play it? Um, Technical skills. Here we go. No notion of uh, oh, no. pivotal circumstance. They have no notion of. Uh... So he's talking about. I think the question my brother asked was about young people. What are young people? What's their understanding of history? What's their understanding of the past? And therefore, what's their understanding of the Emancipation Proclamation? They have no notion of, uh, of the pivotal circumstances that brought about uh, the movement from slavery to freedom. 
of the achievement of freedom. They have no notion of the sacrifices made to bring it about. Uh, perhaps worse still is that they have no notion of what price was paid for them to be where they are at the present time. And uh, little appreciation for their relationship to the whole continuum that is a part of the development of their own development. If they did, I would think they perhaps would take much more seriously uh, their own responsibilities uh, and their own obligations. First, to understand what it was, to understand where they stand in relation to what was and what they ought to do about their future and the future of their children. Does that do it? <laughs> Thank you also for the programs themselves, but thanks very much for coming here and telling us about them and uh, giving us insight into the way you work, but also into John Hope as well. Um, and uh, uh, and I look forward also to the conversation tomorrow, sure. um, where we'll be in conversation with Mark Antony, Mark Antony Neal and uh, John Gartrell who is the uh, archivist um, uh, for John Hope Franklin's papers in the library here. Mark Anthony Neal is, um, uh, of course, the chair of African and African American Studies, and we'll be talking about voice, archives, podcasts, radio, all those sorts of things. So please do join us. That's tomorrow at 11.30. And thanks very much again. Thank you. To me. Thank you.